Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Gary Dorian has spent much of the last decade telling the story of the black social gospel, liberation and religious movement born within the black American church just after the Civil War, a movement that would be propelled by the likes of W.B. Du Bois and provide the intellectual underpinnings for the works and philosophy and activism of Martin Luther King Jr., Gary Dorian has completed his trilogy in telling this story, picking up the story after the death of MLK. The first two books were called The New Abolition, W.B. Du Bois and the Black Social Gospel, then Breaking White Supremacy, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black Social Gospel, and the latest is called A Darkly Radiant Vision, the Black Social Gospel in the Shadow of MLK. Gary Dorian is also the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Social, Social Ethics at Union Theological Seminary and Professor of Religion at Columbia University. Gary Dorian, I always appreciate our conversations, and I thank you for taking this time to join me today. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, it's great to be with you again. Uh, we did... Uh the Breaking White Supremacy book together, and I think we did shows on both of those uh, democratic socialism books that I did after that. Um, but meanwhile, I needed to get back to finishing this Black Social Gospel trilogy. Um, so um, so th that's the occasion for this morning. I, I said in my introduction, the Black Social Gospel is, was, uh, is still around, liberation and religious movement born within the Black American church. Is that accurate? And I should just ask you straightforward, what what is the black social gospel? Well, um, you know, when you get to the third volume of a trilogy, of course, there were two that went before, and um, some people are just tuning in uh, when they open, when they uh, get the book in their hands. So you do have to do a, you know, kind of a quick uh, run through of uh, what have you been saying in these these previous two volumes that take over a hundred years uh, before you're really into the subject matter uh, of this one. Um, so, yeah, there was a kind of fundamental argument made in the new abolition, uh, which is right there in the title. Um, and I do have to do a very quick recap of it uh, at the outset of, of this book uh, to say uh, that, yeah, this is this black social gospel tradition comes from that time in black American history when the Civil War has come and gone and Reconstruction has now even come and gone. And now you have a generation of black church preachers. Um, having to ask themselves the terrible question, what would a new abolition be? I mean, now that we're in this context of, of kind of mania of racist lynching is occurring and the 14th and 15th Amendments are being lost just as soon as they were passed, uh, and, uh, and a whole institution, a kind of racial caste system of Jim Crow uh, is being imposed um, in this country. How do you fend off that? It's there's something like slavery, but it is a different kind of political context test context. Um, and so it's that generation of ministers in black churches in the 1880s, 1890s, having to focus on this terrible question. And that has certain things that are analogous to something quite famous, the white social gospel. Because uh, the social gospel movement this is the very time when in, when in um, mainline Protestant churches, especially like those that supported this seminary right to each union, um, you know, it's just all the rage. The white social gospel is this is this famous thing that created the ecumenical movement and changed the seminaries, brought liberal theology into the seminaries, and so on. And in both cases, the social gospel is always about saying that the church has a mission to transform structures of society in the direction of social justice. Or just to put it more prosaically, that, that the church needs to be involved in ordinary movements, political movements for justice in society. That proposition is always minority in all church traditions. There's just no denomination that just embraces the social gospel or anything like it, and says, yes, that's what we want to do. It's always something that has to be battled in both contexts. Now, the two contexts are different, whether you're in a black church context or a white church. I mean, the black social gospel is something very different uh, from the white social gospel just because of where it's coming from and where it is. And yet there are certain things between the two that are fundamentally important and which, which are in common, which overlap. Um, it's this same social gospel language uh, about 
you know, fixing on Luke 4 and Matthew 25 and doing the work of justice. And there is no gospel that doesn't include justice, including being involved in ordinary political struggles for justice in this country. Um, on the black church side, there's really, you, you have no choice about what to focus on, uh, given the racism in this country. And that's just, just so overwhelming uh, that, of course, it focuses the attention. On the white church side, of course, that was, that was you got a list of six, seven things that the social gospel might give highest priority to, uh, because these middle-class white people who offended the social gospel on that side, they've, they've got cultural privilege and they're in a position of economic ad advantage um, to be able to say, we want to we want to emphasize trade unions or want or urban reform or whatever. Um, but so that's a key difference between the two. Um, but um, my argument was that we've got all this literature about a white social gospel, and yet um, the most the more important one, the, the social gospel tradition that is in fact the greatest religious tradition we have in this country, is the one that took us straight to Martin Luther King Jr. And in fact, there's no way of understanding where he even came from, who he is, without seeing that he's actually in a tradition of religious uh, intellectuals and, and, and um, church leaders um, who have that basic sort of social gospel abolitionist, today we would say liberationist way of thinking about Christianity. Yeah, the Dr. Martin Luther King, the doctor part is not just by chance. Uh, he had a PhD, and it, it, his PhD was in this tradition, in this study? Yes, he came, uh, well, firstly, he studied at Morehouse College, which is just the citadel of the black social gospel um, itself in, in Atlanta. I mean, just it's just generations of these Morehouse men have, have been produced from the late 19th century onward that are... So one, if you wanted to just go narrow, and I'm encouraging somebody to do this, uh, just 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 focus on just what came out of Morehouse. Uh, you could get three volumes out of that. Uh, just there, just all the folks who went to Morehouse, um, John Hope and and uh, Mordecai Johnson and Howard Thurman and King and so on. Of course, if so many of them are of course in this trilogy um, that I've written. Um, <clears throat> So that's a thing. But then for his Ph.D., since Morehouse is a college, for his Ph.D., King went to the place that arguably on the white church side, the white social gospel side of it, has an, a kind of equivalent status. It's a kind of um, equivalent kind of significance uh, in terms of the social gospel, and that's Boston University, uh, where they have, a, they have a philosophical tradition. It's the tradition of post-Kantian personal idealism. Uh, that King is deeply steeped in. That's what he wrote his doctoral dissertation uh, about, is about that very thing. Um, and yes, the doctor to him was, was very important because the, the intellectualism that is in King, he made work for him in his movement activism his entire life. I mean, he was only an every week pastor for a year, and then the whirlwind that came along in Montgomery just took him away. Um, and, um, and now he's out, you know, in the movement. For the rest of his life and then hustling back to his pulpit on Sundays um, <clears throat> but that 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 intellectualism that he got at BU which basically finished out something very similar that he's building upon having gone to Morehouse College and having gone to Crozier Seminary um, before that he he is as steeped in this social gospel liberal theology kind of post Kantian idealist way of thinking about what Christianity means, or at least should mean, as you could be, um, and it's his strength. He said so as plainly as possible when he wrote "Stride Toward Freedom." He just said, "You know, it's my foundation. Uh, I, I I live out of everything out of my mouth. This is coming out of out of this uh, worldview that that um, that every human being has a sacred dignity by virtue of being a child of God." Uh, and that the violation of that sacred dignity is evil. Um, and holding fast to that and seeing its importance as a critique of Christianity, certainly as a critique of American society, um, is, well, that's, that's enough for um, what, what, what kept Dr. King going his whole career. 
Have traditional church powers objected to both the white social and black social gospel? Yes, as I said, uh, just briefly alluded to before a moment ago, um, virtually all of these founders on both sides have an argument with their own church. Um, th this is all, it, it, when I wrote the New Abolition, I had one figure uh, who didn't have this fight with his own denomination, and that's Alexander Walters. He was the blessed child. Uh, he, he's one of these one of these people who just kind of goes through life and people just see the good. He radiates a kind of goodness that that doesn't, you know, where he's able to avoid certain kinds of controversy. Uh, people see uh, the goodness in him, the light in him. So he makes bishop early on. He's a bishop in the AME Zion Church and they just claim him and they let him sort of drag him, you know, them into all uh, all that he cares about. Walters is an interesting case because because he didn't have to have a fight with his own denomination. He spent all that discretionary time helping to build organizations. I mean, the Afro-American Council doesn't exist without Af without Alexander Walters. And later he joined the Niagara Movement. And later he's vice president of the NACP when it was founded. So he used that I mean, it's a classic kind of social gospel application of, you know, your faith to uh, to the to the, the, the struggle. And as I say, he's making he's making use, taking advantage of the fact that he doesn't have to spend all his time fighting with his own church. But he is the lone exception. Everybody else uh, in my first volume has has got firstly got a fight with their own their own denomination. Um, and the people who made the the, the the folks who broke through first in the AME church. African Methodist Episcopal Church, people like Richard Wright Jr. and and Reverdy Ransom. Ransom is the great example of the of this, the Du Bois figure in the black in the black church. Um, so by the time you're in a next generation, now you've got a generation of folks for whom, yeah, this thing has been established. It's got a beachhead uh, in all these churches, um, and it's now acquired some infrastructure and some respectability. And it's you know got it's a whole it's a tradition. Um, and its own institution uh, now? It had to be fought for. Yeah. Uh, and even King, you know, Dr. King had to, ended up having to leave the National Baptist Convention. And his Dr. King's denomination did not support the civil rights movement. Uh, so in the 1962, he had to leave uh, his own denomination, start up the progressive denomination, um, because uh, even, even he uh, had this battle, and, and that late uh, in this what, what, what did social justice mean in the black social gospel tradition? And did it differ from the white social gospel tradition? And does it, is this where we get our notion of, of social justice or even the term? Yeah, concrete, yeah concretely, it's in the in, in black church side of it. Concretely, it is this, uh, the argument, we need to build protest organizations against all that's coming down on us. Um, and that's, um, you know, that itself, that is controversial. Uh, that is not what Frederick Douglass said. Uh, you still have the old convention going, movement going uh, in this time after Reconstruction, where Douglass saying, no, 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 we don't want to build protest organizations. That's just going to upset the white people, and we're gonna, we got we to gotta have full integration, and we're just going to need to succeed. Um, and, and they keep giving those old abolitionist kind of speeches uh, was basically a forum for speeches, and it's it's this social gospel generation that just says no, no. But if it means anything, uh, concretely, what it means is we have got to build protest organizations that make racial justice, that make our right to have the same rights as everybody else, um, be fundamental. So that's that the crucial thing on the black church side. Meanwhile, on the white church side. Yes, the argument for a more kind of socialist way of thinking about social justice does get much further. Uh, you simply have the privilege, the, 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 the opportunity um, to even develop a socialist flank. So on the white church side, uh, while this, the social gospel is pretty reformist um, with regard to this kind of question, a little bit queasy with regard to trade unions, trying to say yes to them, but not full bore, really having the church just be a kind of honest broker between labor and capital. By the time you're already in the early 1890s and the white social gospel, you got a full-fledged socialist flank that's just saying, no, now you've got a socialist way of talking about social justice. 
uh, where, where indeed the social injustice means something, because now it really does mean um, that it's not a question of just bringing everybody to the good. If we just convert all the individuals um, to the good, then they'll do good things in society, that classic sort of reformist uh, way of thinking about how you create a good society. No, it, now you're saying uh, that there's such a thing as social structure. And if there's such a thing as social structure, then you could change all the individuals and that's still, you're still, there's all the evil that's in society is gonna be, in, gonna be in them and you're not gonna be able to change the institutions. That if there's such a thing as social structure, salvation has to be not only individual, but social to be saving. Um, that there's that we have to kind of fix on the on what a good society would be because a good society will help bad people do good things. That's the that's the that's the social gospel sermon about that. Um, a good society that, will help bad people do good things. Yeah, you need to be able to you need to be able to create a kind of society that actually rewards cooperation, um, that rewards people for not just being selfish all the time. Um, this is the classic Walter Rauschenbusch argument against, you know, the, the, the great white social gospel of that generation. Walter Rauschenbusch? Says, yes, capitalism has overdeveloped the selfish instinct in all of us. Um, and that's just quintessential Christian socialism. Um, and which and there's a there's a important flank of Christian socialism in the black social gospel as well. This isn't just a white social gospel thing, um, but it's always um it's it's more embattled there because on the black church on the black church side of this story you're just dealing with something that's just so uh just almost apocalyptic in its violence and um uh, and repression um where uh, simply the right to be uh is what's being um challenged and um and so uh you have, you have many fewer people who just got the capacity to even be able to think about what would a better political economy be? Uh, my God, they're just trying to not get not get killed in this society. <clears throat> um, so that's the social gospel on both sides of it. And as I say, it's one way of getting to it, getting sort of the idea of it would be um, this. We talked a little bit about this when we did breaking white supremacy. And this question about where did Martin Luther King come from? Because he didn't come from nowhere. Uh, he is in a quite distinct religious tradition. Tradition, but it's also something more specific than just the black church per se, because black churches are very diverse. The only thing that all black churches have in common is opposition to racism. Um, and meanwhile, you get different kinds of theologies and different ways of relating to politics and ethics and everything. Um, and and this social gospel way of thinking about what. Christianity is and should be is controversial, uh, even in his church. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. I think is often portrayed as somebody who gave incredibly inspirational speeches, which he did. But if you read his writings, there is he. he it is deeply intellectual. Uh, his, his writings, but but let me move to. Yeah. to um, there's an issue there with regard to making the making the move you know, into the into um, into what's going to be volume three because um, Jesse Jackson early in his career well he, he went to Chicago Seminary because he was persuaded uh, that 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 intellectualism that is in King he needed that is Jackson himself needed and he needed to get it. Uh, by going to seminary, just as King did. And, and uh, Samuel Brocker, you know, basically got him into Chicago Seminary um, to get it. But, of course, that's the very moment when when Dr. King himself took the struggle north to where? To Chicago. Uh, and so Jackson ends up being um, a major player in the SCLC struggle. Uh, in Chicago, or at the same time, you know, he's supposed to be in, supposed to be studying in seminary. The, the idea was he's going to be trying to be quiet for a while and get that kind of intellectualism in him um, that King did have the opportunity to get before the whirlwind of the movement took him, um, and that never quite happened for Jackson. And later on, not that much later, later on, that's going to be an issue for James Cone as well, um, and Cone both times. I mean, no, Cone the first time 
op, you know, he's in the library during the civil rights movement. He knows he needs uh, this intellectualism that he's got this precious opportunity to get. And he can't be out there in the streets uh, uh, in Chicago during that, that very period. He needs to get it. Uh, later on, he's going to have to make the same decision yet again uh, because Detroit blew up in 1967 and he had to, he had to go through it one more time about what, what it was that he'll, he's going to make use of. But this whole sort of question, it's all sort of thrown open for this generation that, um, you know, after, after the, the dreamer has been slain and they're, they, they, the people who were his immediate followers, should we go into politics? Should we go into the academy? Should we keep building these same institutions that we had before? Do we need new organizations? Um, do we even need black leaders anymore? That's an issue. Uh, all of that is in play in the 1970s uh, when uh, when we get that when we start in this uh, you know, what it for me is a volume three um, moment um, and it starts with Andy Young and, and Jesse Jackson in a larger context because those are the two um, who um, got the furthest by taking uh, taking a political option um, although Jackson took longer to get there than of course than than Young did. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Gary Dorian. We're talking about the history of the black social gospel. Gary, Gary Dorian is the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Social Ethics at Union Theological Seminary and Professor of Religion at Columbia University. He has just published his third book on this topic called A Darkly Radiant Vision, The Black Social Gospel in the Shadow of MLK. Let, let, let's talk more about the years following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Again, you mentioned early on, you pay a lot of attention and focus on Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson. Everybody knows who Jesse Jackson is, but maybe not everyone remembers Andrew Young. Um, you know, the first thing I want to say about that, even with regard to that going that way, Mitch, is just, just say, I think Jackson is oddly... Um, underappreciated, under-examined in uh, the literature of black theology, um, in uh, literature that's more you know, broader than my subject, but nonetheless has something to do with it. There is a, there is a pronounced tendency, uh, is certainly in black theology, um, to, to just skip from King straight to Cone, and now we're in a, basically an, an, an academic discussion about you know what happened in theology. And who say. is Cone? You mentioned Cone earlier. So this is going to be part of my argument. Just saying, mm. gotta remember, just what was more important, what impacted millions of people, what had an impact on the Democratic Party, uh, what how it affected Chicago and Atlanta, etc. Between in, with the politics of these figures, so that when I write Volume Three here, I I, do, I say to out uh, the out, outset as a kind of advisory to certain readers, we're going to have to wait till Chapter Four even get into that black theology per se discussion because meanwhile there's just something so enormously important um that happened with regard to this black social gospel subject that as you say everybody knows about yes uh, i mean these are these are figures of just enormous um import uh, in their time that everybody knows um and the fact that everyone knows them has something to do with just this story in some ways getting reaching an even larger kind of significance or even reaching more people than it did on, under Dr. King's time, which is often not how we think about it, and yet it, it was the case. Um, to go to Andy Young, uh, yeah, he was the first one to um, to go into politics. And the first one, he you know, is elected to Congress, uh, had a congressional career in the early 1970s coming out of Atlanta. So even this sort of tradition that now we think of it, I mean, that's, you know, that's the John Lewis, Raphael Warnock, you know, legacy that we've had. Going into Atlanta politics, th there's a shift that happens here, what, late 60s, early 70s? Yeah, but that's, Andy Young was the first person um, to take it. Uh, and he is a disciple of King. He is one of the one of the insiders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And in fact, he had a quite distinctive role in the SCLC, which is, um, Dr. King um, corralled and listed uh, some, uh, you could say, high-voltage, rather volatile personalities 
uh, for the SCLC. He says, you know, we're not we're not going to reason white America out of racism. You know, we're going to have to we're going to have to go into the, some of the most hateful places we can find and turn them upside down and make white America see the racism that's in that's in it and underneath it. Um, and for that, you need people who are willing to you know, go into Birmingham and turn it, up, turn it upside down. So that requires a certain kind of personality that King, King enlisted. Meanwhile, he's got to find somebody who's going to hold this whole thing together uh, to get them all going in the same direction. And of course, that was Andy Young's job uh, for years, is to corral this whole group. It's not really the job description he would have written if he was given a choice. Um, but uh, it is the one, you know, that Dr. King gave him and that he accepted. So that was his job. And he did learn after after we lost Dr. King, it started to occur to him and to some others that, well, he learned certain kind of skills, um, playing the kind of role that he did uh, in the movement uh, through, though, from St. Augustine onward, basically, in, in his case. Uh, so he's at Birmingham and, and uh, Selma and Chicago and uh, all the way to the end. Um, and so immediately you have the question about, you know, what would Martin think of this? You know, going, of going into politics. Yeah. Yeah. Running for office. Uh, yeah. Are, aren't we already taking a lower road? Right. Uh, there's something. Uh, and indeed, they know it. Uh, he didn't want them running for office. Uh, that was not it. Um, he, he said he so before. Himself, hmm? He said so before. He, he, he yeah they knew it people i mean the people who were with him you know or traveled with him and they 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 talk about things all the time about just um <clears throat> uh, i mean you did in the last especially the last 18 months of dr king's life they had they had contentious brutal arguments about what should they be doing right then you know i mean they were all against the poor people's campaign all the insiders uh, Dr. King had to do that despite virtually all of them. Um, and they didn't want to go to Chicago either. Um, most of them didn't want to go there. Chicago um, for the convention? For the, no, I mean, oh. to, I mean to take the, uh, take the struggle north to Chicago as they did after me. Selma. Um, they didn't want to do that. Uh, they said, you know, we've never taken on something like that. We've been taking on these little southern towns where, where, where we have ample, where large group, large black communities and in which we where we have experience now to take the struggle to you know north to a to a big foreign place like Chicago where you got a Democratic mayor who runs everything uh, and has the black churches in his pocket James Bevel who was one of King's you know insiders who said you will get your rear end handed to you uh, if we go into Chicago they fought King about that so Dr King the last eighteen months of his life he's having to fight off you know his own group uh, that 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 can't agree about you know what we should be doing and everybody's got a different opinion uh about you know whether it should be including you know of course his opposition to the war that was enormously controversial in his time um uh he had to farm out when he gave the riverside speech he had to farm it out to two outsiders because none of his insiders were willing to help him write it uh they didn't want him to give that speech well you're going to become a leader of an anti-war uh, movement. What good is that? Uh, and, and and especially an anti-war movement that was that was spiraling into a kind of into something very radical uh, at that time. So just everything was hard and difficult and controversial in the last year of King's life. And then he's assassinated, and it's like now what? Um, and Young, you know, especially writes vividly about this. It's just just the enormous depression. Uh, that set in that just that the, the sheer trauma of just how you carry on in any way um, and uh, you know they did keep going through the motions some of them uh, for Bobby Kennedy for another couple of months and then he's assassinated too uh, and now it's just it's getting really thin as to about who's even left um, to to have you know to have kept supporting what game you know Hubert Humphrey uh, in the fall of 68 uh, Bayard Rustin was one of the few left um, still hanging in there with that. It was just, it was such, in, such enormous blow. Um, and in that, all that aftermath, they're just grasping at straws. What, what do we do now? All right, that's actually sort of my beginning uh, for, for, for this book, to say um, it's, it has now become hard to remember 
you know, what they did. But in fact, there, there's, an, there's a kind of generational spurt, enormous sort of creativity uh, of some folks going into running for office and other folks are building up the old organizations that were the next generation of leaders coming up to lead uh, the traditional organizations and creating new organizations. You got women involved in all these organizations. You got a black social gospel that's becoming a kind of new orthodoxy. Now, it it has this king style social gospel way of thinking about Christianity now has a legitimacy in the churches that it didn't have before, um, but which now has a kind of status as a new orthodoxy such that it has an impact in churches, um, creating bishops and church leaders on a scale that's way beyond what you did before. You have upwards of 350 black mayors elected in the next decade and so on. So you all, all the ways in which um, you give a kind of ferment of activity, uh, of creativity. And that's that's before we even have the womanist, um, you know, um, movement of the 1980s coming along where black women are coming into this, uh, into black theology so strongly. So Young is there at the outset of this, early 1970s. He's the one they kind of settled upon uh, to say, okay, let's get you to run for office. Um, and and all we can say, you know, maybe Martin would have approved of it. They they know uh, this is not what Dr. King wanted, wanted them doing. But they what they could say is, yeah, well, the civil rights bills. We never got that housing bill through really uh, until after you know it took it took losing him to be able to be able to even get that piece of it through. And now that we've gotten the the basic pieces that Dr. King himself advocated for these civil rights bills, what indeed it's an open question. What would be the next generation of this same thing we're going to keep this same movement going on, on about what it's always been about um and of course the, the 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 main thing here is the very thing that just tore dr king himself apart um, I, in his later years was the argument that it's well you've just done something that benefits middle middle class black people uh who want to vote and want to be teachers and you know the like but um Meanwhile, no impact at all on anybody, did it anybody have, further down on the did, scale. Did, was it in conflict with black power movements? Oh, certainly. Well, I mean, the, the whole, this, the, this 1970s period when you're, um, when you're making something new out of what has been out of the 60s, just coming apart the way it did. I mean, you had these spectacular movements of the 1960s, SNCC, and then SNCC, this uh, Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee, um, and then a black power coming out of SNCC, and then black power being such a powerful, uh, dramatic and spectacular thing. Um, and then on the, and on more on the white church, white aspect of SDS. Uh, so these are, these were movements and organizations that had enormous sort of impact that everybody knows about and that moved the needle. And yet they all exploded uh, their internal di dynamics and get rid of the liberals in every case uh, and a kind of radicalization that then kind of set them up for all being all sort of exploding from within as happened in two cases, or from without, has happened to the Panthers because you know the U.S. government just uh, 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 well took them out. A, took them out. There was a I'm forgetting that was Look magazine or Life, um, a very large magazine. It rose and rose and rose. It just what happened to all those black black power leaders, uh, which shoot out that they were you know gunned down in. Um, and if you're next generation watching that happen, firstly, there are people, there are people in this book who are, you know, that that's their products of that period. Um, and people like Eugene Rivers, he says, I was just, if, firstly, I was grateful to still be alive, then guilty that I'm still alive. Why am I here? You know, when, when people I admire have all just been gunned down. Um, and what do I even do with it? You know, that is a, that's that's its own trauma, uh, dealing with what, um, with that. So, so this is a this is a 
this volume three story of mine is every bit as complicated as volume one had been. Volume two is streamlined by comparison. But when I get into volume three, which is the aftermath of the 1960s, all that happened in the 1960s and losing Dr. King. And now we're post the civil rights bills themselves anyway. And now moving toward the end of the Vietnam War. So the Vietnam War is being taken off the table. What what indeed does is the civil rights movement about in the 1970s? What kinds of things should it be about? Which is the same thing as asking, you know, what should the black social gospel be uh, in this context? Um, and then meanwhile, you've got the intervention of black theology. Because uh, there is a, meanwhile in the academy, uh, you've got this uh, movement uh, that does surround James Cone and J.D. Otis Roberts and Gay Rod Wilmore and others who are, who are theologizing um, in a way that's got a fundamental continuity with King and all that, but it's got its own sort of complication, complicated way of relating to it and having to think about it. And it takes 20 years to sort of work out um, the relationships between um, these various things. <clears throat> 20 years ago, I was a Capitol Hill reporter and I covered some of the lawmakers, black lawmakers who were elected in the 70s, people like John Conyers, Charlie Rangel, a few others. Yeah. Um, were, 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 were these figures products of, of people within the black social gospel moving towards politics? Oh, yes. I think, I mean, this is the, the civil rights move, movement going forward. Um, the figures who, most of the figures who are getting elected most of the African Americans who are getting elected to office during this during this period are making some claim, sometimes stronger than others, of for people of, of of a kind of continuity with with the civil rights movement, um, with um, the movements within churches that were that fired the civil rights movement. Um, this is, of course, the very period where you do have arguments about. Uh, maybe we have too many black leaders. Maybe we don't need black leaders any longer. I mean, there are contentions about that. Maybe politics is degrading. We have too many people going to run for office and not enough people building up, you know, what, you know, while core is going down or SCLC is not what it used to be. NAACP is becoming too establishment and, and respectable, you know, arguments about, about all of that. So there are lots of internal sort of debates about what, if, if you think of yourself as being in the line uh, of Martin Luther King and even Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson, what should your politics be? What should you be doing with your faith, with your politics? Um, you know, yeah, that's all. That's, these are matters of uh, contention and debate. Um, and meanwhile, there's a space being created even in the academy for them in a way that's it's a little different uh, than before. Uh, with regard to black theology, because the argument there was that too much of the social gospel is still a kind of, um, it's it's too close to that white social gospel tradition, too much, too much operating along the lines of a kind of white I social ethical idealism. Um, and what we need to do is, is privilege black experience itself as a, as a vantage point um, by which we're going to reinterpret what all these Christian doctrines are. That's the black theology move. And it's not just one thing, because it started in the early 1970s, really late 1969, and it starts with James Cone and Gayrod Wilmore and J.D. Otis Roberts. And you have three different black theologies right from the beginning um, that, um, you know, sort of competing with each other and then others um, to come. But they all do have that kind of fundamental point of departure to say we've um, what we've had thus far has been too much like this kind of white social gospel that's that's ethically idealistic and maybe it's socialist and definitely way too much liberalism um, and 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 even you could say too much like Martin Luther King because that takes twenty years of of having to think about and write about and so on. Dr. Cohn's own own trajectory about Cohn went year struggled with this issue for years about his relationship to Dr. King. Uh, when he finally wrote Martin and Malcolm in America, uh, he says, actually, I'm, you know, I'm in line with Dr. King. Um, but, um, you know, he, he had, 
he had a lot of tension about that in the early 1970s because he is and he is saying something different um, than uh, than than King had said, and so working out the the relationship to King, even what you make of it, uh, that that takes years to come. Um, it wasn't really until the 1980s that we start hearing again about the radical King. It's not like the people around him don't know that he's a democratic socialist and he's a post-colonialist and he's 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 an anti-militarist. And he's just radical in all these ways um, that make it hard to get the get the King holiday. Uh, and yet. Um, it's only really in the mid 1980s that people like James Cone and Cornell West and others start to say, "Oh, we we need to go back to Dr. King. We need to we need to to hold up the King that who really was um, instead of instead of this kind of icon of white liberalism um, who's domesticated." Uh, when you get to that point, now you get a kind of coming together in some ways, merging a kind of certain kind of social gospel and liberationist possibilities. Um, although then you have arguments about that as well, about whether whether you want that or you want to, want to hold them apart. <clears throat> there is one figure I want to ask you about, and of course there are many figures we could talk about, probably should talk about. We have what I like to call the tyranny of the clock uh, in broadcast media. Um, but that is Cornell West. Cornell West is someone, every time you hear from him, he is infusing radical and religious talk together. Is is Cornell West from this tradition of the black social gospel? Oh, oh very much so. I mean, Cornell uh, burst the boundaries of any tradition you would put him in. I mean, he is Cornell's an American religion, um, an American original, like Walt Whitman, which is who contains multitudes. You know, that's what Whitman said of himself. Uh, well, Whitman is one of Cornell's favorites uh, for that. But then even the, the people that sort of he, he uh, will go to <clears throat> that are in his in his sort of canon within the canon, John Coltrane and William James and W.B. Du Bois. Is and John others. Coltrane in the tradition? Cornell. Is John Coltrane oh, in the well, black social I mean, that, tradition? They, this, this is my point now, is that it's not... It's never a kind of singular tradition for Cornell. There's so many lines so many things coming through into uh into it for cornell because he's just he's expansive in that way um if you can re read one of his uh or early interviews about this he got very clear someone was speaking of a westian approach and he was like no no, no don't don't talk about a westian anything he says i am multi-perspectival i am someone who's always willing to look at life through various lenses um and then try to kind of hold together well what what it is, what it means to look at it this way and that way, uh, and another way. So that that Cornell can seem a little elusive to people who think they who think they've got him, and then they read something or think where it kind of blows that apart. Um, he has always been this kind of, uh, as he would say, uh, Jesus-oriented blues man uh, who's just uh, trying to uh, live out the meaning of what it meant to grow up in the black church uh, that he did, and to have the certain kind of influences that he already had when he was 19 years old and got into Harvard uh, and uh, and did a, did an undergraduate degree in three years in Near Eastern studies uh, for with doing the languages um, because he wanted to be able to, you know, study ancient texts and their languages. So then off to, off to Princeton when he's 22 years old uh, to do a PhD um, and also so accumulating all that, all that he, got from these places that he went um and then had this sort of fabulous academic career where he's going from from uh harvard to union to yale to princeton to harvard back to princeton back to union and so on um back to harvard now we've got it back at union uh again so at union we've won this derby we've gotten him four times uh at uh, union over his uh career but um i would say so much of what this whole three volumes is about at its very best uh, would be Cornell writ large. Um, although I would say the same thing of Tracy Blackman and William Barber, because in fact, that's where volume three goes. I mean, volume three is, is geared to get to Tracy Blackman and, um, and William Barber, because that's- in, in a rebirth without, of the poor, you know, a, a rebirth of the poor people's campaign. 
Yeah, you don't need all this intellectualism to be to be just quintessential black social gospel. Uh, you don't even need ideo ideology talk. Tracy Blackman and William Barber are very much that way. You know, they just say all, all I need is the gospel. I'm not. I don't need any other kind of ideological language. Uh, Luke four is enough for me. Uh, do the world. Pay attention to Luke four. Try to try to take it seriously. What, what is Luke four? Live it out. What, what is Luke four? Um, that's where, that's where Jesus talks about his mission. You know to preach good news to the poor and set the captives free and uh, and so on <clears throat> that's this kind of that mission language um and uh, they both say yeah we don't we don't need any uh, ideological kind of language or intellectualism uh, that sort of divides people or makes people feel left out so when i did volume three even though yeah that got chapters in the middle where i go into all the nooks and crannies of black theology and relationships to philosophy and ideology and political theory and so on it's all in there and yet i do make sure that by the time we're ending it's back to we're heading on the way out with with figures who who are straight out of what i was talking about in the 1880s with right and ransom people who just who just held held on to the gospel for all that they're worth uh, and so we need to do the work of justice uh, based on our gospel convictions um, and that is where volume three ends up for something that's been but, around yeah, yeah. I wanted all of it for just just the biggest writ large all the intellectualism all the political theorizing and social ethics black theology all of it yeah corn you couldn't do more couldn't be a more incredible figure really than than cornell and you're just thinking of the politics uh, you, you have his been so career. and thinking of the politics you have his run for president yeah that is so yeah um, well, there's a certain frustration there with, um, you know, I mean, Cornell has has worked for Democrats on occasion. I mean, in 2008, he gave 65 speeches for Obama. He there were places that Obama only went if he had Cornell West with him, um, and and um, Cornell did an awful lot of heavy lifting uh, for Obama. But then, you know, Obama kind of gave him the back of his hand. Uh, afterwards, and um, and so there was a falling out um, between them uh, that was, you know, uh, very sort of controversial um, in its time. Um, then later on, when Bernie, you know, both those times that Bernie ran for president, uh, Cornell worked hard for Bernie, uh, was out there uh, all the time. But so Cornell is consistent about always wanting to be able to use presidential campaigns in order to be able to get a certain kind of message out there that is just is not what you can otherwise say. I mean, if you're just if you're comfortable with being a kind of establishment Democrat, um, the way John Lewis was, I mean, this would be an example of it. Cornell dearly loved John Lewis, but he'd say just he would say Lewis was just too comfortable where it was in that kind of kind of mainstream establishment Democratic Party. Um, and Cornell is always kind of bridled at that, just saying, no, there's, it is so confining, so limited. There's so, the, 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 the boundaries on what you can even say, for example, about the American military empire and what it does in the world uh, are, are, you know, are pretty tight. Um, if you are, if you are beholden the Democratic Party establishment. So he has, he has been saying that his whole career, uh, sometimes within the tent and sometimes out of it. Um, and of course, he's doing it again now um, today. But that, you know, that aspect of him, yeah, that's always been the same. Cornell is, is there is this kind of noble tradition of people saying we, we've got to have voices that aren't just just these two parties. Um, uh, I, I, I'm carefully avoiding certain things that I've gotten into with him uh, with regard to this this uh, race. Um, but um because uh, there are, you know, there are some issues this time that I'm just on my knees praying. Well, you know, we'll uh, we'll turn out all right. But Gary Dorian has been our guest again. Gary Dorian is the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Social Ethics at Union Theological Seminary and Professor of Religion at Columbia University. He has joined us for a conversation about his book, which is a third in the trilogy about the Black Social Gospel. This one is called A Darkly Radiant Vision, The Black Social Gospel in the Shadow of MLK. Gary Dorian, thank you. Many thanks, my friend. It's great to be with you again. <laughs>